In today's video, we are going to make a close equivalent to an N95 mask with very common household materials, without the need for sewing, vacuum cleaner bags, cotton, or wearing citrus fruit on your face. So, for my regular viewers, I've put some of my other planned videos on hold. This video is a little bit more serious, but I thought it was good information and wanted to get it out as quickly as possible. So less d***ing around than usual, maybe. Now, after two weeks and countless hours in the shed, plus many failed tests, I finally worked out a pretty good recipe so anyone can make a close equivalent to an N95 mask, which at a minimum could be created with just an iron and a pair of scissors in about 10 minutes. But with a few extra tools, these can also be batch made quite quickly. Best of all is the materials you probably have in abundance in your home right now. Obviously a proper tested N95 or P2 respirator is always the best choice, but if you can't get one, this could be a close match in filtration, great fitment, yet can be made easily. Personally, I would definitely wear this rather than a cotton mask with sewing holes in it and edge leaks even over a surgical mask, but it's probably not as good as an airtight plastic bag on your head. Yeah, CO2 is going to make your problems fade away. Maybe like yourself, I did a bit of research early on as to what some good filtration alternatives are to N95 and P2 respirators. It seems that vacuum bags came up a lot. I went to investigate this option, however it turns out in all three of our vacuum cleaner devices that it's not 1990. Dustin, then there's a the furnace filter option which was a bargain at $500 postage. But in all seriousness, these alternatives could be good ideas, but there's still the fundamental problem with these, which is supply. Even if they're accessible now, demand suddenly goes through the roof, and then they're just as hard to get as an actual N95 mask. I thought a good approach to this would be, rather than improvising a mask with alternative materials, maybe attempt to replicate one as close as possible while making the process accessible to everyone. So, my next move was to have a good look at an actual N95 mask. Luckily, I have a good variety of used ones knocking around in the shed. Looking at these and doing some research online, almost all masks are made from non-woven polypropylene, which has great air and water filtering properties. It's not a popular textile in the clothing industry, but the good news is it's extremely popular in almost everything else. It's pretty easily identifiable by the matrix of dots on it and can be found in varying thicknesses in everything from reusable shopping bags to cheap aprons, disposable painting overalls, suit covers, and I even managed to find some lightweight material in gauze in the first aid kit. So I grabbed a bunch of different samples. First I was concerned the dots themselves may be a passage for air, but in checking it out on my son's $10 microscope, surprisingly I was able to get a really good idea of the structure. Sorry, these shots aren't the best and just taken on my phone, but it turns out the dots are pressed and sealed, making them look translucent. I then dissected the layers of the masks I had on hand and comparing the masks to the non-woven material, it appears to have the exact same fiber size, even with similar air gaps on some. But the other aspect that makes this material really great for this purpose is that it can be plastic welded, so there are no stitch holes. So what we'll be doing is making a flat fold style mask using multiple layers of material to get a nice deep diffusion with a few refinements I've done to allow different elastic strap options, as well as some changes to the shape so you don't look like a duck. The largest, most economical source of material I found in the house was my car cover, but if you're familiar with my other videos, you'll know that this is soaked in cat bits, so I picked up a new one from the shop. Now the first thing is to wash and disinfect our material. As a note though, if you're making masks for other people, unlike what you might see in this video, the whole process will have to be hygienic and obviously don't make masks for others if you're sick. Now you're going to want to print out the template. I've put this on my website and I've put a link in the description. I've done a lot of experimenting with different layers and combinations of different densities. Of the non-woven polypropylene I had on hand, I found it was best to use three to four layers of the car cover, which is around 100 GSM per layer, and then one layer of a surgical gown, which is about 50 GSM. I get that surgical gowns aren't easily available, but they are a similar weight to disposable painting overalls. As a loose guide, based on my research, car covers are about 100 to 150 grams per square meter, shopping bags are 80 to 100 GSM, Disposable painting overalls and surgical gowns are a bit lighter at about 30 to 50 GSM. I'm going for a lighter layer to go against your face, which is more comfortable, but not totally necessary. However, it probably does provide a better seal against your face. 
So if you're just making the one mask, you can use a template to trace it onto each of the layers and then cut them out with scissors. I was trying to work out a way to cut more masks at a time to make it more time efficient. And if you remember the hot wire foam cutter that I made to cut material for the cooler drone video, I set this up to see if it would work. And it turns out it does an absolutely amazing job at cutting this stuff. And it's fun. Experimenting with how many layers I could do at once, I pretty much got to the limit of how many I could stack in a pile. So if you're looking at cutting lots of masks or even just want to have fun with it, it's definitely worth making one. I've actually made another video on how to build one like this. It costs about $30 in parts, plus an old car battery and table, and about 30 minutes to put together. Additionally, to make it easier to cut more in the future, I traced and then cut out a wood template so I can run the hot wire along its edge. After you've cut the basic mask shape, use your template to also mark the elastic holes in the top layer. Now we are going to weld together all of these filter elements around the edge. Proper N95 masks are made using an ultrasonic welder. None of us have that obviously, so I managed to work out a technique with an iron. When done right, this is beneficial over sewing, partly because you don't need a sewing machine, but also because sewing introduces perforations to the material, which can leak air. Also because when dealing with this many filter elements, it's important to seal around the edges thoroughly so air travels through every filter element and doesn't take a shortcut through the edges and the seams. Plus doing it this way, seals it nice and flat against your face without any little bits of cotton stitches messing stuff up. Having said that though, if you do have trouble with this next part of the process, you can sew it and you'll still end up with a better mask than if you're using woven material like cotton. I tried so many techniques to get this to work, I almost gave up a few times. I'm not going to lie, it's not the easiest to learn, but once you nail it, it works awesome. Before doing it on a mask, get pieces of scrap material stacked in the same way as your mask and do a bunch of test runs with your iron. Just before you do that though, this can produce a fair few plastic fumes, which you probably don't want to be breathing, so do it in a well ventilated space. I ended up whipping up this quick fume extractor arm out of a beer carton, an old computer fan and this silver tube sh that I've had in storage for years that I bought for some reason and I can't remember why. But it worked a treat and it turns out I also accidentally made a hovercraft. I got a bit distracted playing with this for a bit with the kids. Yeah, good times on the hover soccer field. Anyway, back to the task at hand. To begin with, we're just going to weld the outer edge of the mask, leaving the front seam for now, which is the V-shape. To do this, you want to get your eye into about 180 degrees on the back corner, if you can measure it. Your iron will probably differ from mine, but the two I tested, this setting was about maximum heat or slightly under. With the front of your mask facing up, use the back corner of your iron, holding it at about a 30 degree angle, with the bottom of the iron facing the outer edge of the mask. Then with a fair bit of downward pressure, you can slowly advance forward around the edge of the mask, aiming about five millimeters in from the edge. Make sure you do a bunch of test runs until you find the right combination of temperature, speed, and downward pressure. It's tempting to hold the iron flat, but it simply doesn't work to bond through all the layers. If your iron leaves a trail that's cut all the way through the layers, the iron's too hot or you're going too slow. If yours is like mine, with your bottom layer being a different colour, this is actually helpful because you can see it start to be revealed as you move the iron around. When you're done, let the weld cool down for a bit before messing with it, otherwise you're going to ruin the join. Don't touch it! The best way to see if you've been successful with your join is that you haven't contracted a virus. No, the best way to see if you've been successful or not is to hold it up against a bright light and you should see a translucent line around the entire edge. Then looking on the other side of your mask, you should see a shiny depression around the inside edge of the mask. You can use your thumb to push the inner lining around to make sure it's bonded all the way through. If it hasn't worked, you f***ed. No, if it hasn't worked, you can run the iron over it again an additional time. However, you only get a couple of lives doing this because the plastic starts to break down with heat. By the third or fourth time, even if you get it to join, it will start to get more brittle and is more likely to fail later on. Now, if you've got a really good bond all the way through to your back layer, you can use a pair of scissors to trim the jagged edge of the plastic. Don't trim too close to your weld line though, leave as much border as possible. 
I've had some pretty good luck trimming with the hot wire as well. It doesn't look as good and it can produce some little sharp bits that need to be trimmed off, but it is a bit of extra backup to stick all the layers together. We can move on to doing the nose seal rubber. This part is really important to create a nice airtight seal on your face. Looking at existing N95 masks, they appear to use a very low density foam rubber, which is about two millimeters thick. It looks like they use either NBR foam or very soft EVA foam. The only NBR foam I had on hand in a similar density was in the engine bay of my car and this really soft exercise mat. You have to be careful though, because mats like this are often higher density EVA foam also, which isn't soft enough to contour to your skin properly. Whatever you do use though, it has to be closed cell so it doesn't let any air leak through. As a rough guide, it should feel as soft as your skin when pressed. Overall though, if you find some foam that has an adhesive backing and is two millimeters thick, you're winning. I had to use the NBR foam exercise mat, which has the perfect feel, but has to be sliced into thin strips, which was a pain. So depending on what you have on hand, you need a strip that's two millimeters thick by hundred millimeters long and about 15 millimeters wide. You'll also need some double-sided tape to match the width, then stick this onto the back of your strip of foam. As a little improvement over the N95 mask, I've also cut little 45 degree beveled edges on each end of the foam strip. This allows it to sit flatter on your face without little air gaps. Okay, you can now stick this strip across the top inside of your mask and press it down firmly. With that complete, it's now time to do the front seam. This one is a bit tricky because we're using so many filter layers, so this seam will have eight to 10 layers of material that you'll need to join together. At the time of recording this, I'm still a bit on the fence about the best way to do it, but I'll give you some options. Okay, the first thing I tried was plastic welding it to allow it to be done without the use of a sewing machine. To do this, it's similar to doing the outside edge weld, except this time, as soon as you've run the iron all the way to the top, you'll need to flip the mask over and then do the same thing to the other side. My main concern with this option is the join might be a bit brittle from the additional heat and fail later on, or there could be some little hidden pinholes in the welded seam. After you've done this, if you hold it up to the light, you should probably expect to see some transparency still where the plastic is pressed thin. However, you need to look out for the brighter, more obvious holes. To make this join safer, I'd say the best thing to do would be to run a bead of hot glue up the middle of the mask to make sure there's no holes and to give it a bit of extra strength. Your second option is sewing. Trying this, I'm really not confident in the seam's ability to stop air sneaking in through the edge of the layers. If you do so, you're probably better off doing a double stitch if you have time and play around with the stitch tension to get it right. Then the third option, which is currently my favorite because I feel like it's the safest so far. This is doing a double stitch down the front and then using the iron to melt the plastic along the front edge to seal it up. I've also since found if you wear gloves, you can pinch along the front of the seam while the plastic's still hot to get a nice good seal. We can now move on to the elastic straps. Similar to the N95 masks, we're going to use braided six millimeter elastic. If you're having trouble finding elastic, you can use wider braids and I found that you can actually split it down the middle and it doesn't fray later on. For this template, for an adult size, you're going to need to cut two lengths of 28 centimeters of elastic. To attach them, I'll show you the best way to do it first, which uses a soldering iron, but if you don't have one, there are alternatives I'll show you after. This method is the closest to how some N95 masks are done, which is nice and strong. With your soldering iron, you'll find that most have a removable tip. Loosen the grub screw on the side and it should fall out, or you may have to thread it out. Then you'll want to find a bolt that fits in the hole in the end. It doesn't matter what type, as long as you can get it to stay in there and that the head of the bolt isn't wider than your elastic. Before I've tightened it up, I've also put it in the vise and I've filed the head of the bolt flat. Now, like your plastic welding earlier, this is just a case of working out the right combination of heat, time, and pressure. So you'll want to practice on some scrap first. With your soldering iron at temperature, put the end of your elastic in position, and then simply press down the head of the bolt onto the elastic. With mine, the temperature can be adjusted, and I found that when it was set to 300 degrees, it was exactly 10 seconds for a good join but this will likely vary for you depending on what soldering iron you have. 
and even things like the bolt length can have an effect. When you've done it, to know whether you've been successful or not, look at the braid in the elastic, which is the areas between the rubber strands, and you should see it become translucent, showing the colour of your mask underneath. Plus, when you flip your mask over, you should have a shiny depression where you attached it. After you attach it, don't move the elastic around until it cools down, otherwise you'll ruin the join. DON'T TOUCH IT! This method is great because it bonds through all the layers for strength. If it doesn't join, I've also found that you can have a second and third attempt without ruining it. Just don't let the tip of the soldering iron touch your mask material directly, because this has a much lower melting point and will create a hole pretty quickly. Okay, now for option number two. You can simply use hot glue. It works okay, but it doesn't stick to the elastic as well as the weld holds it. Plus, it only bonds to the top layer of your mask, so it's probably not going to last as long. Then the third option is using a stapler. To do this, for strength, lead the elastic in from the opposite direction to where it will be pulled from, then put your staple through. I'm not a big fan because I think it could introduce air leaks. Also, like one of my shop-bought N95 masks, it seems to fail a lot and need to be reattached. However, the benefits of stapling it, it allows you to use rubber bands if you can't source braided elastic. There is one more option, as done on some N95 masks, and we've allowed for this in a template. This involves folding the edge of the mask over and onto itself, and then tacking it in place with hot glue. Then you can simply run the elastic through the loops that you've created. Doing it in this way can also allow the elastic to be more easily adjusted or replaced. Now we can do the last part of the process, which is the nose adjustment wire. Wire or any kind of metal strip can be difficult to integrate into a mask without the use of a hem. So hunting around the shed, trying to think of ways to replicate existing N95 nose adjustments, the idea jumped out at me to use flat electrical cable, like you'd find in the roof of your house, and it works a treat. Cables like this have fairly solid wire cores, bending easily and then holding their shape. Flat electrical cable like this is a couple of dollars per meter at hardware stores. Then with some rough sandpaper, give one side of the cable a bit of a sand to roughen it up. This will make the glue stick much better. Cut it into pieces, about 9 centimeters long each. Give it a good clean so it doesn't look dodgy. Then, if you want to be fancy, you can pre-bend it into shape, which can reveal some of the rough strands of wire in the end, which you can then sand or file. Now, with the hot glue gun, run a bead of glue along the rough side of the cable, then stick it across the nose section of your mask. When you do it though, try not to put the middle of the wire too close to the edge of the mask, because this could interfere with wearing safety glasses, if that is a factor. Make sure you hold it in place while it cools down, once it's set, you can then pre-bend it into a slight bell shape. With that attached, just have a quick look over the mask, checking for any flaws. Then, depending on how it's going to be used, you should disinfect it. I also found it handy to throw the masks in the dryer, with the heat turned completely off for about 15 minutes. This helps aerate the masks of any plasticky smells, and also removes any loose material that it may have picked up while making it. After this, remove them from the dry with gloves. You can then put them into individual snap lock bags to keep them clean. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how these masks turned out. As far as the mask performance goes, uh, yes, I understand that you have to be clean shaven, but we found that the fitment and feel was exactly the same as a flat fold with no leaks around the edges. It works perfectly for dust around the shed. Otherwise, as far as filtration goes, I unfortunately don't have the equipment to test it properly, but we did unscientifically try it out with a few different aerosols. Equally, both the flat fold N95 and homemade mask noticeably filtered out a good amount of the product, leaving just a gaseous smell, and then you wake up in your neighbor's garden two days later, spooning a beach ball. What was interesting though, is it actually outperformed the rigid N95 mask that I had, because it turns out the fitment just wasn't as good. This mask doesn't have the nose wire and appears to rely on additional foam, which I guess isn't the best choice. But that brings me to the most important point, there's no point wearing an N95 or P2 mask unless you fit it and handle it properly. Make sure there's no air gaps around the edges, and always remember, 
Once you're wearing it, you have to treat the front of your mask like your asshole. Never touch it, especially in public. If you do accidentally touch it, wash your hands immediately with soap and water without touching anything else prior. And don't let strangers stick their nose in it. I hope everyone is safe and doing well. Chris and I are doing okay. We are currently self-isolating and doing the homeschooling thing with the kids. Like many people though, we're basically unemployed now with all our scheduled work for the year getting cancelled. But I guess the good news is we now have more time for YouTube videos. But you know, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Thank you for supporting this channel by subscribing and sharing our videos and for the supporters on Patreon. I hope this video is helpful to people. Maybe share it with your friends or family. Maybe hit the subscribe button. I'd love to know if you have a go at actually making this yourself as well. Send me any pictures or any tips that you pick up or work out as you're making it. Would love to know and I can share that with my different sharing places that I share things. Thanks again for your support. I'm Craig Turner. YouTube channel is Turn81 and I'll catch you next time. Hey, look at that. Huh? High visibility. Where is he? He's right here, you can tell, because it's fluorescent orange. No losing me in a hospital. Or I can serve as a road cone.